Before we get started um, on the actual class, um, why don't you scratch off all this stuff on the windows? <laughs> Michael uh, emailed me effectively a question from last week, uh, what amounted to effectively a question from last week, a scripture that was brought up in what we talked about last week and also somewhat what we talked about Saturday in Turkey, uh, about the church, the idea of the church, if you will, the assembly, and the idea that the assembly is the assembly of Israel and the assembly of Israel has always existed. Correct. Okay. And the following verse was brought forward. And so, well, first of all, we'll read the verse, and then we're going to play some hermeneutics, although with hermeneutics we haven't gotten to in class yet. Um, we're going to play a little bit of hermeneutics and go see what that verse means. And then we'll pick up on today's uh, material, which is going to be lo uh, logic errors. errors, basically errors in logic. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, 18. Anybody want to read Matthew 16, 18? Especially if you got a KJV. <laughs> and I, I know those are real rare. Right? <laughs> and, and I tell you that you are keeper. And upon this rock, I will build my assembly. The gates of the will not prevail against you. Okay. So what I is... Know what to do. I've read it. Okay. okay. So, the argument that's made then is that Mark, Matthew 8, uh, 16, 18 says, I will build my church. Future tense. KJV has church. Okay? Now one of the things that I've pointed out before is that that word church, what does the word church actually mean in English? Assembly? No. No. Generally what does the word church worship? actually mean in English? Either a place of worship or an assembly of Christians. Yes. If you look up if you look up the word church in an English dictionary to find out what the English word church means, the two pr the primary definitions of the word uh, church is once you get past the building where Christians worship is essentially well, it's an assembly of Christians. In fact, the first two definitions will be. All Christians as a whole. And the other will be, the other definition of the word church will be a sect or denomination of Christians. Okay, that's what the English word church means. It means a group of Christians, an assembly of Christians, whether it be the universal assembly of Christians or a local assembly of Christians. Okay? Or a denomination or sect of Christians. But that's the key word there. That's what a church is, right? Look it up in English. That's what it means. Does the word ecclesia have anything to do with Christians? Yes, they equate to an angry mob running in the street. In, in Acts chapter 19, I believe it is, there's an angry mob in the streets that's called an ecclesia. If you go into the uh, Greek pagan literature, you'll see that the worshippers of Dionysus, or Bacchus, when they got together for their uh, um, uh, assemblies, which erupted into orgies, that was called an ecclesia. It was also Christmas. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, the origin of Christmas, yeah. No, that, that's what Christmas was in the beginning, orgies. Yeah. And it's for Christmas. Ecclesia, okay? Now, the reason I bring that up is because, just because you see the word church there, you see the KJV translators and the translators of sense have put an English word, church, that is a technical theological term where there is no parallel technical theological term at all in the Greek and in the Hebrew and Aramaic. Okay? In other words, they made up this technical theological word. They didn't make it up, actually. It's a pagan origin, Kirk. And they put it there to, to mean something that, does, that the original language doesn't mean. There's no parallel technical theological term in the Greek. 
The word in the Greek here is, I will build my ecclesia. And make it simple. In Aramaic, it's a dot. In Aramaic, Matthew. And in Hebrew, Matthew, it's the whole. Okay? Now, question is, is the church spoken of here, or the assembly spoken of here, let's figure out what it is. Is it what many commentators have taken it to mean? Is it the universal assembly of Christians, or even the, the body of belief, the body of Messiah? which we've talked about before. I would argue that it's not, and let me show you one. Let's look at the context. Start at verse 17. <coughs> Happy are you, Shimon ben Yonah, Simon, uh, uh, Simon ben Jonah, for this was not revealed to flesh and blood, but to you that it was revealed to you by my Father which is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Kepha, and upon this rock I will build my assembly, and the gates of Tafti will not prevail against you. And to you I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you prohibit on earth has been prohibited in heaven, and whatever you uh, permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. If you have the KJV or something like that, it'll say bound and loosed or whatever. All right. So this church, this assembly, what does it do? What does it, what, what does it do? It binds and looses, right? Right. Bind and loose. Where else do we read in Matthew about a church in the KJV or an assembly that has the power to bind and loose? Anybody? Matthew 18. Let's turn just two more chapters down. The only other usage of the word church in Matthew and the KJV. Matthew 18. <clears throat> verse 17. <clears throat> And if you will not hear them, speak to them him in the assembly, or the church. But if he neglects to hear in the assembly, let him go be to you as a boy or a transgressor, or a, a, a Gentile and a transgressor. Surely I tell you, all that you will prohibit on earth has been prohibited in heaven. Also, all that you will permit on earth has been permitted in heaven also. What does it mean in Hebrew terminology, by the way, I'm sure you guys all know, to bind and loose. It's an idiom. Okay? You know, like we talk in English, I talk to, I say, uh, Eric was in a pickle. If you try to translate that into Hebrew, the person in Hebrew would be looking at you saying, well, how did you get into a pickle? <laughs> and it takes to explain that the statement has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with pickles. Okay? Well, Binding and loosing in Hebraic terminology idiomatically refer to prohibiting and permitting activities. All right? Now, let's figure out what the assembly that binds and looses in Matthew 18 is. Let's start up in verse 15. This is all very familiar material. If your brother sins against you, go and reprove him between you and him alone, and if he will hear you, you have won your brother. But if he will not hear you, take your, to yourself one witness or two, that the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Okay? Is that familiar? Is that, what's that from? That's the Torah, right? That's the law of witnesses in the Torah. Does anybody know where it's from? Is Deuteronomy 19.15. Okay? Well, Deuteronomy 1915. Let's keep going, and then we're going to go back to we're going to be good Bereans, and we're going to go back to Deuteronomy 1915 and see what it's talking about. And if he will not hear them, speak to him in the assembly. But if he neglects to hear in the assembly, let him be to you as a boy and a, and a transgressor. All right. Let's go to Deuteronomy 1915 and find out what this assembly is in context. Deuteronomy. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sins. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall a matter be established. Familiar? Verse 16. 
If an unrighteous witness rise up against any man to bear a perverted witness against him, then both the men between whom the, contra- uh, uh, between whom the controversy is shall stand before Yahweh, before the Kohanim, and the judges that shall be in those days. And the judges shall inquire diligently, and behold, if the witness shall be a false witness, and he testifies faultlessly against his brother and whatnot. In other words, what's the next stage after witnesses according to the Torah? Take it to the... The judges. It shall be in those days. Right? So what the assembly, Matthew 18, is talking about that binds and looses, that prohibits and permits? The Beit The Beit So now, let's go back to Matthew 16. If we know that the, 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 the church that binds and looses in Matthew 18 is the Beit now let's go back to Matthew 16, verse 18. And I tell uh, you that you are keeper, and upon this rock I will build my assembly, and the gates of Tati will not prevail against you, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and who, whatever you will prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and so on. What's the church there? Is it the body of Messiah that uh, Messiah is talking about building? No. What's he talking about building? A big name. A body of judges. We see that body of judges later in Acts 15. To use Matthew 16, 18 to try and justify a theology that says that the church is a new entity because Messiah is building it is to totally misunderstand Matthew 16, Matthew 18, and the Torah. If you read the Torah, if you just look at these passages and go look them up in the Torah and see what the Torah is saying, you couldn't possibly come away thinking that the assembly that binds and looses is anything but the judges. There's no way to get a body of Messiah out of it. Unless you use the word church there instead of assembly. Unless you put the word church there like the KGB translators do. Okay. There's just no basis for it. It's it's like way out there. But it's inherited. And you look up in the the commentaries, and the commentaries are going to... Take that to be the church. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the scripture that comes to mind, I don't know where it is, it's referring to Yeshua is, is, is um, pretty much rebuking, I believe it was the scribes and Pharisees, and he said that the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you and given to another. So, was another he generation. Another generation. Was well, he, he doesn't say it's no generation. Okay, well, he this is people. Was he referring to possibly the fact that they had made themselves the, the judges and the leaders at that point a and blew it and washed it so bad yes. that he basically was going to raise up another group of another leaders and judges? Or another, yes, exactly. And that's uh, a whole other teaching. That, that, whole that teaching. makes a heck of a lot yes, more does. sense. And that's what Matthew 18 and Matthew 16 is about and has nothing to do with a uh, new body of Messiah that replaces Israel, or right. that competes with Israel, or that is different from Israel, it has nothing to do with what dispensationalist Christianity teaches that the church is. Mm-hmm. All right. You see how much how how much we have to unlearn, <laughs> and then how when we learn a little bit, this changes, and then that changes, and then this changes, and then that changes, and all of a sudden it's like it's like taking something. Um, if you know anything about like, chemistry or something, like taking something and melting it down and then letting it um, uh, re-solidify and crystallize. And all of a sudden there's order where there was all this disorder. <laughs> all right. Well, also, the other word is rock. You have to go back to Torah and know what the rock is. And it's, it's, it's referring to the coming of the Yes. And uh, he said, upon this rock, he said, so he's referring to what Keith has said, the rock was. And also, and also there's the keys of the kingdom there. Yeah. And the keys uh, are the authority to rule. In fact, it goes back to Isaiah 22 where it talks about the keys of the house of David. Okay. David had the wife for he was the king. Yeah. Okay. Um, and... Uh, where we get the idea that Kifa was the Av Beit Din because the vice president of the Beit Din of the Av Beit Din in the rabbinic literature was said to hold the keys because he was 
He held the position equivalent, among other things, to sergeant of arms, and he was responsible for allowing who could come and go from the assembly meeting that was taking place. So he had the keys. So Mike, I got another quick question. <coughs> They got their own teaching machine. Hey. <laughs> he said you got your own midrash going off on the side there. No, I was asking him. I was asking him a question. It was, uh, I was wondering uh, in the, the translation you have uh, top T. Um, how would you describe? How would you describe that? I know it's not. We're going to have so much fun over the next few months <laughs> because there's so much. That's a little side. You know, top T is the lowest parts of Sheol. Okay. Okay? I mean, Shaol, that's low, and Takti is like the bottom of Shaol. And there's a lot of traditional Takti. That's probably what they asked you to go after you burn. I'm just kidding. Don't take that. I got another quick quick (laughs) statement, remark, question, ask, observation, whatever you want to call it. That when the when I when I first learned this years ago about binding and loosening, understanding is prohibiting and, and disallowing and allowing, um, where it says where it says uh, whatever you would prohibit on earth or allow on earth has been permit, prohibited in heaven, or, mm-hmm. and whatever has been permitted on earth will be per, has been permitted in heaven. Which I really like that part of the translation that he did. Can you also say has already been? And the reason I'm saying that is because I wrote an article one time basically saying that we are, quote unquote, the police, if you will, of, of the kingdom here on earth. In other words, we are to find out what is allowed and disallowed in right. heaven and therefore express that or police that or point it out or bring it to um, understanding by saying that's not allowed in heaven, therefore it should not be allowed here on earth. Right. So in other words, well, what? Kosher police. Kosher, Kosher police. police. Well, <laughs> you know, Kosher judges. They like don't want to yeah. be Torah terrorists, as I've heard this term lately. But in essence, we are Torah police. We are supposed to make sure Torah is observed. Well, we don't enforce Torah. We well, judges. But or at least it, the Beit Din, the local Beit Din. It's, a, it's an enforcement, but there's not a... Developers. The enforcement is there, but it's not a basic based on punishment. In other mm-hmm. words, when the Beit Din is established, it's basically saying this has been... We need to know what the rule is in order to in order to basically... I don't know if you want to call it enforce it or not, but we, we're supposed to somehow or another bring it to light. Let's get to hermeneutics now. <laughs> this is hermeneutics, ain't it? No, but I mean the plan study. Okay. We got, we've got, like, got a lot of material. We got a lot. We got material to cover tonight too. So, I mean, I, I enjoy the meat washing and we'll, we'll, we'll go. Just don't months take, months this, ahead. Ahead. take this out of the tape because it's good. Oh, oh no! I'm not <laughs> All right, and it goes. It, it was a follow up to last week, which is why I went in and did it. All right, we're going to talk about logic errors and rabbinic Judaism and the uh, Talmud and whatnot. A logic error has two names, teshuva, repentance, turning back, okay, like, uh-oh, that's not right, okay. 180 degrees around. Right. Go back. And the other one is pirka, an objection or a contradiction. Right, and... We're going to learn the basic logic errors, just to kind of give some background to those who weren't here. The first, we're like on our third class. The first class we talked about um, making arguments, uh, what a premise and a conclusion is, uh, what inductive and deductive reasoning are. We learned all the rabbinic terminology for a premise and a conclusion and an argument. And uh, then last week we learned about categorical propositions. And um, um, actually made use of some, uh, for examples, which brought up the material that we're following up to just now. And uh, and now we have logic error. So the first logic error. Anybody have any idea what it is? The most probably one of the most important logic errors. Equivocation. No. What do you think? That's one of them. But that's not. 
This is one of the worst logic errors. You got to say it louder so it something. One of the worst logic errors. Oh, okay. uh, is that you'll hear there's different names for it. One is begging the question. Okay. I like to call it. This is very descriptive. Circular thinking. Or it's known as we call recursion. It's the most aggravating logic error. Okay, that you can just when when you're talking with somebody. Because circular thinking is when their conclusion assumes that the premise is true. I mean, I'm sorry, the premise assumes that the conclusion is true. Is that backwards? The premise assumes that the conclusion is true. Now, if you already knew the conclusion was true, if the conclusion was an axiom, you remember what an axiom is, uh, a statement that is true uh, intrinsically based on its own merits, except in as being true, a truism. If the conclusion was already an axiom, you wouldn't be formulating an argument to prove it in the first place. All right? So, I like to phrase the circular thinking this way, is to say, I... No, I have the truth because I am right. And I know I am right because I have the truth. logic error and it's people fall into it all the time. They make arguments and you stop and analyze their argument and you say, wait a minute, your argument only stands true if you assume you're right in the first place. But if you're wrong, then your argument, your, your premise wouldn't be right. So your uh, your whole argument falls apart. What is the other term for circular thinking? Recursion or begging the question. Recursion? Um, does anybody know how to spell recursion? I just spelled it R E C U R S I O N. That's how I spelled it. Yeah, that's correct. My spell checker didn't explain. Okay. Recursion. <laughs> You'll often find that when you're arguing around in circles with somebody and you and you get to a certain point in the argument and then you come full circle. If you stop and you analyze it, it's because they're, they're engaging in circular thinking or you wouldn't be doing that. Okay? All right. The next one is called false conversion. False conversion. False conversion is when you assume that the inverse of a proposition is true. Wrong. Let me give you an example. All Dalmatians are dogs. See, that's true, right? Right. Now, if I reverse that statement, and I say, okay, therefore, all dogs are Dalmatians. All dogs are Dalmatians using that logic. Does that hold true? Nope. Now, we know what dogs and Dalmatians are, so it's easy to see that it's not true. But let me read you a statement with mythical terms, and you'll see how easy it is when you're using mythical terms, and therefore terms that maybe you don't know what the group does or does not include in the first place, and you start reasoning through it how difficult it is to catch this. If all thrones are thrones, and all thrones are thrones, are all thrones thrones? 
Why? Now, the, let's plug some terms in there now that you know, and you'll see the answer is no. But it sounds good at first to say yes. If all dogs are mammals, and all mammals are animals, are all animals dogs? No. Okay. False conversion is to invert a logic statement and assume that the inverse statement is true, and it may, that may not be the case. Okay. All right. <clears throat> the next one is, and this is uh, almost silly to include, but we must include it because, unfortunately, throughout history, it has come into play. There's a Latin term for it, argumentum ad boculum, but we're just going to, I'm not putting on Latin, so we're just going to call it, in English, appeal to force. That sounds like Quill has got the loudest voice. Yes. Uh, what was it Benjamin Franklin said? Um, uh, he who, who uh, might is right, might makes right. Might makes right. Might makes right. Takes off the carry. Um, yeah. That's rock and roll. Benjamin Franklin had a more colorful version of that saying. Uh, that you know, it's interesting. Uh, we've, uh, we're watching the History Channel of Benjamin Franklin. He was quite a colorful fellow, and uh, he has a, a number of sayings that aren't so commonly known because they're so colorful. Um, this one was. Pile the SH word on reason's back, <laughs> which he gave as a equivalent of uh, might makes right. In other words, uh, 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 the the he who is in power will make it make sense. It will be you know demanded that it's a truism. This is when a proposition is accepted as true not because it's the result of a sound argument. Remember, we learned about the uh, argument being sound and valid and all that. Not because of any of that. Because rejecting it is punishable. <laughs> the, con the consequences for rejecting it are, are uh, uh, so high that the argument must be accepted. Say that one more. Proposition is accepted not as true, not because of the result of a sound argument, but because of the threat of punishment if it's not accepted as true. Now we all know that that's not a valid that's a lot that's not a valid way to to do logic obviously, but when you put it in the rules, then you can turn around and say ah. The second is true not because it is but because. I mean, the threat of force. Yeah, like um, Galileo. You all know the story about Galileo, don't you? Galileo uh, invented <coughs> the telescope, and uh, he was so excited about it. He took this telescope, and uh, uh, he, uh, one of the things that he could see with his telescope was Jupiter. And he could see Jupiter had four moons, and these four moons were going around Jupiter. But the church dogma of the Catholic Church at the time was that the Earth was the center of the universe, and everything was going around the Earth. So he invited the Pope himself to come look through his telescope and see these moons going around Jupiter. And proof, his proof that... The Earth wasn't the center of the universe, that everything didn't revolve around the Earth, and that these, these things were orbiting around Jupiter. And uh, uh, they took him down and they showed him all the different devices that they, they had to torture him with. And uh, uh, they were very, he was, because of who he was, he was given special privilege, and they showed him what they could do to him. And then they brought him out and, uh, in a public assembly. And he was required to come out and publicly recant and state that the Earth was, in fact, the center of the universe. So he came out, he did so, and he recanted, and he said that the Earth was the center of the universe. And then as he walked away from the podium, he muttered loud enough for the audience to hear, yet the Earth moves. <laughs> they put him under house arrest for the rest of his life, and everything that he wrote from that point forward had to be approved and before it went out to anybody. So, oh. In the 1980s, the Roman Catholic Church publicly apologized and admitted that he was right. I'm sure you appreciate it. that long. As I remember hearing it on the radio in 1984, I think it was or so, the Roman Catholic Church publicly apologized and admitted he was right. Okay.
Okay. Thank you for Copernicus, I think. I'm sorry? Uh, Copernicus? Uh, I think the same thing applied to him. He drew maps as well. I had a friend who had a copy of an ancient map. And he drew the map so that it appeared that the Earth was the center when you, when you look at it at, at first glance, which was the case. But he drew it in a very clever way to, to show the way that things really rotated. Okay, the next one is... Um, oh, this is one that I'm very familiar with. This is called Argumentum ad hominem, which is that a pro- proposition is rejected... I don't know how to write this down. A proposition is rejected not because of whether it is valid or sound, but because of an attack on the reputation of the one presenting the argument. <laughs> okay, write that. Please write that down. Okay. Oh, it? no, it's, it's called argumentum. A proposition is rejected. I'll, I'll give you the, the Latin for it. No, what, what is it? It's argumentum. Add hominem. <coughs> A proposition, I'll just read this slowly. I'm not that good at writing it. A proposition. What is the English from? Um, argument from. Add is two. The same, huh? Add is two in Latin, isn't it? Argument and, yeah, argument to. Or against the man? No, I'm not a Latin, yeah. Right. Argument against the man, hominem, yeah. There you go. There you argument go. Argument against, against the man. man. Very good. I'm not a Latin expert, so. The proposition is rejected not because of its validity or soundness, but because of an attack on the reputation of the one making the argument. Remember when I started this class, I told you that the hundred can get you in more trouble. Making solid arguments that were irrefutable, logically, would get you in more trouble than uh, anything else. And that's because one of the logic errors, one of the things that your opponents will resort to, is argumentum ad hominem. Well, first thing they try to do with somebody is discredit them. Right. Exactly. No, we talked about the form of goal, and one of the things we talked about was you got a person, a teacher, that uh, um, is talented in the area, we'll talk about that next week, that has that, fills that office. Hasatan will attack that individual with slander. And, uh, 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 we talked about the four strategies and how they correspond to the four offices, uh, four of the five offices. Um, okay. Next, circumstantial argument. And this is one we run into a lot too. A lot of these ring, or ring bells for you guys. What was that again? Circumstantial, um, argument. circumstantial argument. This is an argument is either uh, accepted or rejected, not because of whether or not it is valid or sound, but because of the deeply held beliefs of the person to whom the argument is presented or those of the presenter. Deeply held beliefs by the person whom the argument is presented or those who are presented. Custom beliefs? <laughs> yeah. Of the person? Argumentary. These are obvious, yeah, the, the deeply held beliefs of the argument of uh, either party. Gene Swagger says you don't have to keep talking, therefore you don't. Well, that's another error. We'll get to that. Oh, that's, that's close. close. What? 
That's, that's a different one. That's a close. That's close. Close. That's closely associated. But this one actually comes from within. This one is, I've always been raised to believe. Right. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. I've always believed. You know, it's part you of telling me I've been doing this wrong all my life. Yeah. Who do you think you are? Heard that. Okay. The next next logic error is um, argumentum ad ignorantium. <laughs> Sounds like the argument. <laughs> 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 it takes place when a proposition is accepted as yeah. true solely because it's not been proven to be false. It's accepted as true. True, because simply because it has not been proven to be false. Like evolution. Well, yeah, there's a good uh, <laughs> saying that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I have a, a good example of this. I was in a debate at one time with this guy in Acts chapter 10, a uh, guy, guy citing Acts chapter 10, and he was uh, dealing with Cornelius and Cornelius' uh, immersion and whatnot, and he was trying to make the argument that Cornelius didn't get circumcised. But the whole basis of his argument was simply that Acts 10 didn't mention that Cornelius got, whether or not Cornelius got circumcised, therefore he didn't. You can't use Acts chapter 10 to prove that working Cornelius didn't get circumcised simply by virtue of the fact that he doesn't mention what, that he got circumcised. Okay? Now what was that called? Arguments what? Argumentum ad ignorantium. The next one is the one we're coming up on is the one uh, about to come up on is the one that Eric mentioned, Jimmy Swagger says. That's argumentum ad. Well, I'm not even going to try the Latin stuff. We're not going to go Latin here anyway. Um, argumentum ad. <laughs> the next logic error takes place when an argument or proposition is accepted not because it is true, valid, or sound, but because of some outside authority declares that it is true. For example, an argument is not valid or its conclusion is not sound. But the argument is accepted as true because the church says that it is true or because someone states that it is true. That's not what the church says. You know, it's funny. When I was growing up in in school, as a child in school, Mm -hmm. I believed I was being taught in my science class. And so therefore, I grew up all for a long period believing something that I was taught in science class. And one day I made a statement. What I learned in science class. So I didn't say I learned in science, I just said God. Well, that was the dumbest thing that someone ever said, and I didn't know any different, and I learned back later. So therefore I put a lot of validity into what I was taught by my teachers, but only because my, my teachers were supposed to have been those that were teaching me. This is why we have so much to unlearn, especially those coming out of the church. There's a lot of <clears throat> there's a lot of teaching out there that by you know so-called known people that unfortunately okay. Next is the accidental case. The accidental case. This occurs when a generalization is usually true. But then it's applied in a special situation where it's not true. I'll give you an example. All men have two legs. Can we agree with that? Categorical proposition here. All men have two legs. Long John Silver was a man. Yeah, but he had two legs before he lost one. Therefore, <laughs> born long 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 he was born long 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 without them, so because of uh, exposure to the mother to feline feces during the early stages of pregnancy, which long a, a disease which caused him to have flippers instead. There's a that's an actual medical thing. All right. Although you're supposed to stay away from, stay away from litter cats. boxes, cats, yeah. and pregnant. Yeah. That's true. 
All right, so that's an example of... Bacteria is a cause of What is that called? Generalization is usually true... Accidental case. But, I mean, the description is usually true? Yeah, you take something that's usually true, a generalization that's usually true, almost always true, uh -huh. but then it gets applied in some special circumstance in which it doesn't happen to be true. Well, that one could be the, uh, um, the the church says too. Yeah, the church says. Okay, false inference. False inference. This occurs when it's argued that because a statement is true in a certain situation, it's always true. Okay. False what? Inference. False inference. It occurs when it is argued, this is uh, basically inductive reasoning. This is the, 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 uh, the chink in the armor of inductive reasoning versus deductive reasoning. That's false inference. False inference is when there is um, something that's normally true, very similar to the last uh, logic error. you got something that's normally true, okay? Um, it occurs when it's uh, argued because the statement is true in a certain situation that it's always true. In other words, you wrongly generalize. And that wrong generalization can happen because you've seen several instances, okay, where it is true and then you wrongly generalize. An example is that whenever you open the refrigerator door, is the light on? Yeah, when you open the door. So you might wrongly conclude that the refrigerator light's always on. Okay? You might wrongly generalize. You might wrongly infer that the refrigerator light's always on. When in fact, it's actually only on when you open the door. Okay. That's false inference. False cause. This is when you assume that one element follows another element because one thing follows another chronologically that there's cause and effect that may or may not be there. I say it's Okay. False cause is when you assume that because of a chronological relationship that one thing happens after another thing that there's a, that one thing happened as a result of the other thing. That there's a cause and effect relationship that may not actually exist. Correlation does not necessarily imply causation. Wow. Dang, sound really good. <laughs> <laughs> go back to well, then we could get into quantum mechanics and talk about cause effects that precede the causes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was called a false what? False cause. I'll go back to this one. Complex question. Oh, these are fun. There's two forms of complex questions when a question is posed that assumes something, and answering the question will um, uh, give a fault, wrongly imply that something's true that's not true. Michael, have you stopped beating your wife? No. <laughs> I don't see him yet. You can't say yes. And you, you can't, can't say, say yes. No. You can't say no because when he says no. He implies that he's been beating her. If he says yes, <laughs> if he says yes, he stopped beating her, then it implies that he has been. And if he says no, then it implies that he's still it. Yes, exactly. So it's a proposed to assume the, the question that we, the, 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 the answer to which is put forward, that the, the answer to which will wrongly imply something is true that is not true. Usually because something is built into some presumption, is built into the question. For example, um, there's this book that I have railed against, an anti-Semitic book called Christianity Unmasked. All right, and this statement is in the book. It's an anti-Semitic book. Would Yeshua be supportive of the very elements that desire to see him eliminated? Would the scriptures instruct us to give to our support those who want to destroy our Savior and our intended way of life? Now you see how 
things are read into the question. This is like saying, um, well, here's another one. Um, here's a political version. Uh, it can be raised. Then there we are. This is a, this is the way this can be put, played out politically, for example. Just as an example, so I can say. Are you in favor of reducing more welfare spending and starving thousands? Now, any answer to that question implies things that aren't true. If the person says, no, I'm not in favor of starving thousands, then it may imply that they're not in favor of cutting welfare spending. Or if they say, yes, they're in favor of cutting welfare spending, then it wrongly implies that they're in favor of starving thousands. In other words, you take two things and you marry them together wrongly and then throw them out there so that, in the question so that when the person answers it, they she or something. Yes, they're going to catch one too. Either answer wrong and pleasant and it's not true. Didn't they ask you sure a question that his answer could have been, I knew it was yes. a trick question? Yes, yes. We'll talk about that some It was a, when they... Uh, uh, gave him the coin and they said, yeah, that's right. should we pay our taxes? Right. To Caesar. And do you remember how he answered the, the, the question? Whose picture is on the coin? Whose what is on the coin? His face. Description. No. Whose picture? Image. Image. Keyword, image. Whose image? Now, whose image was on the coin? Caesar. And what was Caesar supposed to be? Uh, oh, God. So he's saying, look, you're the ones with the idols in your pocket. You tell them you want to hang on to them? <laughs> you're running around with these idols in your pocket? You want to know if you're asking me if you're supposed to hang on to them? <laughs> you got them. <laughs> well, and there, was a, and there was a question that Yeshua proposed also. When he asked him, was the, was the baptism of John the Baptist authorized by... Yahweh or by man? But yeah. When well, they asked him, they and asked he said, him if they said by man, man, then they would be. Yeah. He or if they said by yeah. Yahweh, then why didn't but, he? But it, was, but it was a valid statement at the time because his authority had come from Yahweh. Okay. All right. Uh, where are we? Complex question. Okay. Um, irrelevant conclusion. I don't have any good examples of this. I wish I did. But it occurs when one attempts to prove a particular conclusion by arguing from premises that were actually directed towards establishing some other conclusion. Okay. I, I've got one that might answer that. It's like um, uh, when they asked him about uh, your disciples uh, don't eat with wash hands, and then the conclusion here is uh, therefore he declared all foods clean. There you go. This occurs when one attempts to prove a particular conclusion by arguing for premises that were actually directed towards establishing some other conclusion. Another good example is the Sabbath. It was okay to heal on the Sabbath. But, uh, and we'll get into this later when we get into the seven rules of Hillel. It would be an error to say, well, then it's okay to do anything on Sabbath. Same thing happened when I was over at uh, Bill's last week. I think it was Rome, somewhere in Romans that talks about the food issue. And Paul was making this argument of, about food, and, and, and the assumption is that everything that people eat is considered food. When he's actually talking about things that were created to be food. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Equivocation. Somebody brought up equivocation. Uh, is that uh, Nathan? No, you said equivocation. Okay. Do you have a good example? Do you want to tell us what equivocation is? Or no. <laughs> oh, come on. Okay. It occurs when an ambiguous word means one thing in the premise and in the conclusion it means something else. Now, this is a rather obvious version of it, but there's others that are where the, the ambiguity is much more subtle. A record is an album of music. The criminal had a record, therefore the criminal had an album of music. All stars are energized by fusion. Tom Cruise is a big star. <laughs> Therefore, Tom Cruise is energized by fusion. Okay. Now, 
Where it really gets into serious logic though is when you have an ambiguous word in which there are subtleties. Let me show you what I mean by subtleties of words and especially how you get in translation, okay? Um, person is speaking in one language, okay? And they say the, um, the home that she was visiting was enchanting. Okay? Then it gets translated into another language, and they, the person in the other language adds, puts a, uh, loses the subtlety of, of enchanting and says that it was spellbinding. Okay? Then it gets translated into another language, and they say that it was hexed. Hmm. Now go, home goes from being enchanted to hexed. <laughs> In other words, it goes from, yeah. Because these, these words all have different subtleties of the same meaning. But by the time you get from here to here, it's been inverted. Okay? The next step in is you bring it back to the original language, and now the home is cursed. Yes. I got one for you. Yeah, that happens, by the way, when Job says, curse God and die. Sounds wise to him. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, in Job, where it says, curse God and die. What is, what is the word for curse there? Birth. What does birth mean? Right. No way. Go with that. Really? Same thing happens with the uh, mixed grain. It means go with the... It's actually glass scar and die. The... Uh, that occurs in the Torah where it says not mixed grain in the field. That's a yes, the also, same thing the, there. The, yeah. what, what happens with mixed, uh, if you take uh, um, uh, mixed Two different seed in the field, grain, you mix them in the field together. What happens? What happens to it? Does anybody remember what the, what the Torah says happens to the, to the uh, produce? It's you get a bloom, it's cursed. It? It's defiled. KJ, 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 defiled. Hebrew says Kodesh. Yes, Mikdash. What is it? What's that? What, does anybody know what Mikdash is? Hectish. What? Hectish? Yeah, hectish. Yeah. Holy. Property of the temple. Now, it was a bad thing. You didn't want to, to do the mixed seed because what it meant was you sacrificed your entire you ended up sacrificing your entire crop over the property of the temple. It's not something you wanted to do. No. But not because it was defiled. Okay? Which this is important because in Matthew 13, Yeshua tells us about how the enemy comes in and, and mixes right. the seed in. Okay, the, the wheat and the tares. And the beauty of the wheat and the tares story is that the enemy, unknowingly, by sowing in mixed seed, he hasn't defiled the whole crop. Uh-oh. He's given it all up. It was hectish because of what he did. That's, wow, that's like a big difference. I'm going to write a sermon on that. Um, okay. All right. See, well, we've got so much to learn. So I have much fun stuff. Maybe this isn't correct, but this is very interesting. I met a young lady many, many years ago that was from Russia. She was a Russian, uh, Russian Jewish girl that came to live in America. She was here a few years. And her understanding of, of words was trying to understand how to communicate. Well, their terminology for communication or basically visiting with something was the word intercourse. To have, to have, con- to have conversation. Mm-hmm. So she writes me a note and says, I desire to have intercourse with you. <laughs> well, I now, no, I'm serious. I did, had I not known that her innocence was there, I could have took that wrong because our terminology is sex. In the 1970s, Jimmy Carter went to the Middle East and he got off the plane and he began to give his speech. And the translator in giving his speech, he said, when I departed from the United States, and the translator, when he translated the speech into whatever the language was, the nuance that he didn't have a word for departed, the nuance was abandoned. So the crowd is like dumbfounded. Carter gets off the plane and says, when I abandoned the United States <laughs> to come here. <laughs> he I was going to say. For that. <laughs> yeah. So the right. question is, is that similar to that or is that a different that yeah, that's, that, that, well, that plays into it because you can have you can have a pivotal word like that in the premise and in the conclusion and have it shift meaning, and then the conclusion turns out not to be true because uh, the, the categorical proposition had ambiguities. Actually.
All that's right. all, that's dumb about all the translation. <laughs> all right, we've got three more to cover and limited time, so let me go ahead and... The next one is amphiboly occurs when a grammatical structure is in some way ambiguous. Let me give you a good one. Let's look at Luke 23, 43. What do you call it? Amphiboly? Amphiboly. It occurs when a grammatical structure is ambiguous. Luke 23, verse 43. Truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, okay. it dramatically changes the meaning of this passage depending on whether you put the comma here or here. Oh, wow. How oh, interesting. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, you can. Yeah, that definitely would change the whole entire thing. Okay. That's ambivalent. <coughs> and there's no punctuation anywhere. Hey, yeah, so there's, there's, no, go. there's no punctuation. Take there. your point. Or that's the same way with the uh, Yokana. A what? voice crying in the wilderness, prepare, or a voice well, crying close. in the wilderness. Yes, yes, exactly. Depending on where you put the comma, is it a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare away? Or is it a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare away? So we have presumptuous comments counted. Yes. Okay. This brings us to something very similar called error of accent. Error of accent, where the meaning is pivotal upon which word is accented in the phrase. Uh, I saw a Saturday Night Live routine many, many years ago, when it was actually funny. <laughs> back in the old days. That had been about 15 years ago. Yeah, years ago. it was funny back then. Um, okay, the meaning is pivotal what? Um, the routine, uh, I remember it. Uh, uh, Ed Asner was the guest on it. The routine was that Ed Asner was playing the, the head of this nuclear facility, this nuclear reactor. And he tells his employees, his new hires, he leaves them in charge and he tells them before he leaves, he says, now remember, you can't put too much water in a nuclear reactor. And then he leaves. Well, of course, they then spend the next little while arguing over whether he meant you can't put too much water in a nuclear reactor, so don't worry about it. Or, you can't put too much water in a nuclear reactor, so you better be careful. Or, you can't put too much water in a nuclear reactor, maybe the next ship could. <laughs> you can't put too much water in a nuclear reactor, but another kind of reactor you Yeah, can. exactly. You can go on and on. Yeah. But yeah. this becomes very important. Go ahead. Meaning is pivotal upon the inflection. Accent. It becomes very important in the scriptures because in Hebrew and Aramaic, questions are commonly nothing more than a statement with an inflection, making it a question. So in Exodus chapter six, I believe it is, chapter six, where it says, By my name, Yahweh, they did not know me. Or is he saying by, name, by my name Yahweh, did they not know me? Several instances from the New Testament, where one where Yeshua says that Moshe, that uh, uh, Mo Moshe did not bring down bread from heaven, or is he saying, did not Moshe bring down bread from heaven, depending on how the inflection is? When Caiaphas gets angry at the Beit Din that he's speaking to, 
Does he say, you don't know anything? Or is he saying, don't you know anything? It makes a huge difference in how it's inflected. In those cases, it's not huge, but in Exodus chapter 6, so it makes a difference between whether or not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew the name of Yahweh or not. Okay. I'm sorry? Okay, last one. Error of composition. This occurs when certain traits are attributed to the components of a set, and then it's falsely concluded that the whole of the collective must share those traits. Actually, there's two more. Two more. This is the next one. For example, the chair is made up of atoms. Atoms are invisible. Therefore, the chair must be invisible. The last logic error in our list is error of division. That's the inverse of the error of composition. And it takes place when a collective set of traits are wrongly attributed to a single individual. For example, um, Republicans like um, uh, George W. Bush. Well, then you find some certain Republican that didn't, and say, you see what I'm saying? You wrongly generalize, and then you go down to the specific individual, and the individual may not hold the traits of the collective. Any questions? I know today was kind of uh, very. Uh, you got to put together some outline notes or something that you have. It's hard to listen. Right? Yeah, well, I've got them all listed out. You need to put it up and put together some handouts. Yeah. Um, next week, uh, Wednesday, we're going to be doing the Bible study. Yeah. Uh, next week, we're going to uh, talk about what we can learn from Christian learning. Kind of like, um, you know, you can find good things in a slot bucket if you go there and pick them up. She can really take some tips. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about the, uh, we're going to talk about five, that uh, Protestant, Protestant hermeneutics has come up, modern Protestant hermeneutics has come up with five basic principles. They don't have any rules, but they do have five principles that are good principles, and we're going to talk about those five principles. And um, uh, that's primarily. We're also going to talk about in the process two strains of uh, of uh, hermeneutics that existed early on in Christianity between uh, the Antiochian mindset and the Alexandrian mindset. Um, primarily, we're going to talk about five principles. Five principles. And then the next week, the four levels of understanding. And the next week, we start on the seven rules of Torah. Thoughts? Okay. Michael, you can close us in a prayer? Sure. Father Yahweh, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your uh, teaching through James, the things that uh, we're hearing tonight. We're, we're, uh, we ask for your understanding along with the wisdom. Help us to apply it in our studies, Father. I pray, Father, as each of us go forth now, Lord, that you be with us on the road. Travel mercies I claim for us, Father. I thank you that you watch over us and bring us together again. Uh, this Shabbat, or at least next Thursday, Father. I praise you for all that you're doing in our lives. And we bless you with all that we are. We will be having uh, services on uh, Saturday, like the other Saturday, for those uh, who um, it's doctor boxes over there. Everything goes to the rental building. Um, and uh, that's about it. And, uh, any other yeah, I, questions? I got a question. Rather show question. Okay, so bless God and die. Uh, so what was she saying? That you know, how, how would you bless? Okay, the the, the understanding from curse God and die. I understood was you know well if you curse God back then God would like shoot you dead with a bolt of lightning or something. Okay, but bless God and die. How, how would well, the reason it said that it's translated curse God and die is on the presumption, it may be true, 
Uh, presumption that that uh, bless was being used as a euphemism for curse, rather than actually say curse God. Um, but, oh, oh, so that she would but be cursed. If you look in Job, but if you look in Job, what it actually does, what it actually says in the Hebrew, isn't curse God dies, it's bless God dies. What she says. But you just said a second ago that could also mean go with God and die. I did. Well, I thought that's what I heard. Maybe not. But that might have been a part of the, the cultural uh, things that were going on at the time, too, is the last words out of your mouth. And she may God have been, uh, yeah. not And she may also have been lampooning his faith. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. But, but he did say, Jerusalem, they are the Oh, he Oh, he Oh, he didn't. Oh, he didn't. Oh, he didn't. Oh, he didn't. Do you want this still recording? So, so is there any support? Is there any support for the idea of bless God and die? I mean, it doesn't say that, but is there any support for that translation? I know it may not make a huge amount of difference, but it's just interesting. It's it's an interesting thing to read on, Uh, and most people are aware that that's what it actually says. They should be. What about when he said, "Well, I I don't know if he said it, but he cursed the day he was born." Yeah. yeah, well, he did, right? He basically. Oh, are you saying he did? Oh, he cursed the day he was right. You know, made that day be forgotten, etc. He still didn't curse Hashem. Find out if it's for a Saturday, if you're here, we're going to be talking about the manifestations of the Ruach and how they correspond to nine of the ten major um, qualities of Elohim and how the, they form three triads and the three triads correspond to three of the armor items and three of the strategies of Hasatan and three of the four offices and uh, Tie a, tie a lot of things to get. You know where Job that is? 